Good morning. Well, welcome to October. Isn't this a wonderful month? It's one of my favorites. It's all about yellow and orange and red and the celebration of leaves, giving their all in their last moments of glory, letting go gracefully, swirling on the wind. We've got lots of lessons to learn from leaves. I am Laurel Whitehouse, personal pronoun she, her, hers. As of July 1st, I'm a member of the parish committee, thanks to your vote of confidence last May at the annual meeting, and thanks to my husband who put my name in the hat. <laughs> we are so glad that you've all chosen to join us on this beautiful day in the sanctuary, which just has so much history and so much beauty to offer. And a special welcome to those of you who are visitors, perhaps here for the first time. We are extra specially pleased to see you and we invite you downstairs afterwards, uh, right below us, for some community time. Our mission here at First Parish in Wayland is to build community, to search for meaning, to deepen our spirituality, and to make a better world. And we need everyone to do that. If you have questions about First Parish or Unitarian Universalism, a member of the membership team will be downstairs to answer questions at a table during social time. Or you can speak to Reverend Deborah, to Kate Holland, our Director of Religious Exploration Extraordinaire. And uh, anyone who is on the parish committee would be happy to answer questions after the service. And we'd love to just talk to you and see what uh, you might want to know. And a big thanks today to all of the service participants whose names are in our order of service. So let's take a moment now and say hello to each other. We can wave to those in the pew and remember to wave to those online. <laughs> so once again, a heartfelt welcome to all of you and we will turn our hearts and minds now into the spirit of worship. Beautiful. Good morning. I am Reverend Deborah Bennett, and it is a delight to be with you this morning. I use she, her pronouns, and thank you for your welcome of me in my fullness here at First Parish in Wayland, and I know that you welcome each other as well. We have another beautiful day here, as Laurel pointed out. It is fall, yay, what a beautiful day we have. And tonight, today, our, uh, our topic begins this month with the gift of heritage. 
So a new topic for us to explore this month. We're going to explore it from several different perspectives. And we're also going to, also going to take time this month to celebrate the LGBT History Month here at First Parish. It was first celebrated in October of 1994 and was made an official History Month by President Barack Obama back in 2009. October is also recognized as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And throughout the month, you will see various buildings in Wayland lit up in purple lights, including our own building, to bring awareness to this ongoing crisis. And we will be hosting the domestic violence vigil right here at First Parish on October 18th at 7 p.m. So I hope you'll join us for that. Today we begin our Meaning Manners Sundays. And I am very excited about today's service. These are going to be services Kate and I are thinking maybe once a month, kind of depends on whether you like them or not, but, um, but these are Sundays where we're going to step out of our normal worship service and you're going to have some uh, opportunities to choose your experience. So Kate's going to give us more information about that a little later. But to begin our exploration of heritage this morning, I'm going to open with these words from Dr. Carl Jung who says, I became aware of the fateful links between me and my ancestors. It does happen every Sunday when I begin to talk, doesn't it? I think they're going around town to alert everybody of what's happening here. We'll be seeing the crowd coming in soon. Okay, I'm going to start over. So this is the, uh, Dr. Young. I became aware of the fateful links between me and my ancestors. I feel very strongly that I am under the influence of things or questions which were left incomplete and unanswered by my parents and grandparents and more distant relatives. It has always seemed to me that I had to answer questions which fate had posed to my forefathers and which had yet to be answered, or as if I had to complete or perhaps continue things which previous ages had left unfinished. So indeed, we are in a continual state of creation and recreation and connection from past to future, from ourselves to each other. And that is our exploration for the month. I'm glad you're joining us. And each week, we connect with our Unitarian Universalist ancestors and those around the country by sharing in the lighting of the chalice. The chalice is our symbol of Unitarian Universalism, and the light reminds us that we want to be a beacon of light and love in the world. So Pat and Keith Sims are going to race up, and they're going to be our chalice lighters this morning. And the chalice lighting words are in your order of service. And as they light the chalice, let's share those. We promise each other with open minds and loving hearts, we gather to search for meaning, to care for one another, and to work together for a better world. Thank you. And now I think Charlie Anderson is going to lead us in a little hymn singing. Are you not, Charlie? That's the plan. That's the plan. Let's do this. It's a beautiful hymn called Building Bridges. It's in 1023, and that's in the Teal Hymnal. Please rise in body or spirit. And of course, it's around, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> when you look at the bottom of the, of the hymn on 1023, it says, words are from the women of Greenham Common peace occupation in England. And these are women who were working together for a better world. They were protesting the presence of nuclear-tipped warheads on cruise missiles that was, were stored in Greenham. In 1982, 30,000 women formed, linked arms and formed a circle around the, the Air Force Base. In 1983, 70,000 people gathered to form a line that was 14 miles long. And these protests went on for at least 10 years, and the missiles were finally removed in 1991. But now, we're going to sing about it. <laughs> so we're going to have, divide into four parts. So from the partition to the wall, there will be part one. From the partition to the aisles, part two. Partition, um, uh, aisle to the partition is three, and partition to the window is four. Polly will play it through for us once, and we can just listen. Then we will all sing it together once, and then we will start 
at this end and then we'll so when when the when that group is done with the first line this group will start and then this group and then this group and we'll sing it through twice once again extra credit at the end when you're done singing if you want to keep singing the last phrase until the last group is done that's extra credit so Polly can you take it away please get somebody up here that knows something about technology. <laughs> so I'm Ted Barnes, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm a lay minister of this congregation. Um, this is the time in our service where we set aside for the sharing of joys and sorrows that we hold. In both our sharing and in our witness, we affirm our covenant to care for one another. If you'd like to share a personal joy or sorrow, please feel free to come up to the mic or I can bring it to you if that's easier. Um, those online can um, sh type their Joyce or Charles in the chat, and I'll try and walk and chew gum at the same time. So is there anybody that has something to share? Thank you for your open hearted sharings, everyone. Today, as we explore the question of the role of religious community in our life and specifically the purpose of our time here in worship, one answer to that question, of course, is connection. In addition to the connections we nurture here, we also practice connection by reaching out to the community outside our walls and supporting other organizations committed to peace and justice. We do this through action and by sharing the plate each month. And this month where we lift up the work of the Sudbury Wayland Lincoln Domestic Violence Roundtable. The roundtable is committed as a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting safe and healthy relationships, raising public awareness about abusive and controlling behaviors, whether exhibited through bullying, teen dating, domestic violence, or elder abuse and ending relationship violence in all forms. This morning we share the plate with the round table. 
If you prefer to give online, information is available on those orange cards in the pews. In the spirit of our connection and commitment, the offering will now be gratefully received. Oh, good. There you go. So um, I get to explain what Meeting Matters is, and I'm really excited because I love these Sundays. I know other people don't. I respect your choice. I respect your choice. I really do. But I love them, and so it's kind of a pick-your-own-adventure day at, at First Parish. So Meeting Matters, we're going to go and give you two choices. So you can come downstairs, and we have a multi-aged experience, which I'm so excited about. So we're going to take cameras, we're going to do a photo scavenger hunt, and we're going to try and bring what we're thinking about First Parish into pictures, which I think is really kind of a cool thing, to think very differently and think of it like, what, what would that look like? So there's that and then you can stay here. <laughs> or you can just stay here. Or you could just stay here. Any contest? <laughs> you could stay here and listen to a fabulous homily. And um, there'll be a reflection from the pews afterwards. But you could come to cameras. <laughs> And I am told that the choir is even welcome to join us downstairs if they would like to do that. So, again, there you go. It I is. hope he'll join us either here or there. And thank you, Kate, for putting that together. I mean, really, it's a beautiful multi-age opportunity for us to live our values and really have some time with our children. So I will not take it personally. I'm going to turn around, and I won't see who leaves. <laughs> and, uh, no, please do some people. Please join Kate. Now I'm going to be looking at you. So. <laughs> All right. Let's, are we I think we now? have some walking music. Walking Kelly, music, please walking follow. Music, Kelly.
Polly, you better stop playing or I'm not going to have anybody left in here. <laughs> I love Polly. Don't you all love Polly? Well, a few weeks ago, at our lovely welcoming picnic, I was gifted with a swag bag. It's a little first pair of swag bag. And in the swag bag was a beautiful little book by the beloved First Parish Minister, Reverend Ken Sawyer. Does anybody remember him? No, in all, uh, all humility, I must say I am deeply humbled to be able to stand at the pulpit that he occupied for 38 years. And I know for many of you that were here when he was here, remember him so fondly, and uh, I'm sure bring his memory with you uh, when you come in. And his spirit is indeed with us today, and his words will be with us as well. Because I was curious, so I just started to page through this little book, and my eyes fell on delight by one particular sermon. It was dated uh, September 1982, and it was called, Why Do We Bother? Has anybody read that one? Yeah. Clearly, this question that I've decided to explore today was not one that I was the only minister. In fact, many of your ministers have broached this subject. Don't take it personally that they ask, why should I bother? But I'm going to reiterate the quote from Carl Jung when he said, it has always seemed to me that I had to answer questions which fate had posed to my forefathers. And indeed, Ken and I, as ministerial relatives of this faith, have both sought to answer this question that surely did not begin with us. So this question, why? Why gather here each week? Why church? Why religion? Why, when there's so many other options on a Sunday morning, do you choose to come here? What's church for, anyway? In his sermon from 40 years ago, Ken comments about the decline in church attendance, a situation that has not necessarily reversed. About the decline, Ken says, for me, the situation raised a challenge to the traditional liberal assumption that people are innately religious and that it is simply human to congregate with others in a religious community. And Ken went on to state that clearly that despite this decline, he continued to hold firmly the belief that indeed humans have a need for religion. Now I agree with his assumption here I too feel that it is human to want to gather together with others and that it is human to be religious. But if that is so, why are people not flocking to church? And maybe more pressing for us as Unitarian Universalists who are so open and welcoming to all and to many theological beliefs, why is our religion not busting at the seams? So here I turn to Ken again, who says this. He says, I know some of you are uncomfortable with the notion of yourselves as being, quote, religious. For some of you, being religious still means being sacrimonious, overbearingly moralistic and unforgiving, irrational or harshly creedal. This is not what I have in mind, he continues, when I speak of us as religious people, or when I say that people are innately religious, that we all have religious needs. And then he adds, I cannot help believing that there is a religious dimension to human living that we ignore or impoverish at our peril. And now I think he's getting to the heart of the matter. It is not that people are religious or not religious. It is that, like it or not, there is a religious dimension to our human living. Although at times I've worried that as a, liberal, a liberal religion, that we have traveled so far down the secular pathway of self-sufficiency, rationality, intellectualism, that we are unwilling to acknowledge that we have a religious 
dimension to our living. Now, Ken goes on to remind us, however, that the primary dilemma of life still exists whether we claim to be religious or not. He outlines that primary dilemma as this, number one, we will die. Number two, everyone we love will die. And number three, along the way to death, there's going to be lots of suffering. This was a very inspiring sermon Ken wrote. <laughs> but then he adds an and. He says, and along the way, in the midst of this assured suffering, there is still beauty and caring and bravery and moments of absolute joy. According to Ken, a religious community's purpose is to help us find meaning, meaning in all of that. And so if our purpose is meaning making, perhaps the pressing question for us to address this morning and in our faith is not so much a question of why we gather or what church is for, but perhaps it's a question of how. How do we create a space on Sunday mornings that nourishes and touches the religious dimension of our lives? How do we gain or regain that ability to sit with that human religious dimension of ourselves and dare I say in a UU congregation to allow spirit to find its way through the cracks of our knowing minds. Now before I address this question, I must admit that while I was in seminary, I was not sure that I was a Unitarian Universalist. I mean, sure, I agreed with the principles, and I embraced this wisdom that there, are, that there is wisdom found in many sources. And I love that we spoke of meaning making. But to tell you the truth, my first experiences in a UU congregation were less than inspiring. They were nice. I did not disagree with the minister's words, but neither had they stirred me. As a student, I often didn't wondered whether I, as a minister, would be able to reproduce the intellectually sound, well-informed, and morally outraged sermons that I often heard from the pulpits. And then one day in my UU history class, we were assigned to read the infamous Divinity School Address by one Ralph Waldo Emerson. Perhaps you've heard of him. He, he didn't live too far from here. The Divinity School Address was delivered before the senior class in Divinity College in Cambridge, Sunday evening, July 15th, 1838. I think the graduating class was about eight people and there were some family and friends who joined them. And speaking to these highly educated scholarly men, soon to be ministers, Emerson, after some introductory words, got to the point and he said, the test of true faith certainly should be its power to charm and command the soul as the laws of nature control the activity of the hands. And he told these ministers, the faith should blend with the light of rising and setting suns, with the flying cloud, the singing bird, and the breath of flowers. I know his words get lofty. It went on for a very long time. But the gist of what he was saying was this. In many different ways, Emerson told these young ministers, he said, the purpose of church should be to make contact with the soul. And that the minister's job is to help draw that soul out into the light. And he goes on to say that if that is not provided in worship, then the worshiper is, and I quote, defrauded. At one point, he describes a colleague, and he says, I once heard a preacher who sorely tempted me to say, to say I would go to church no more. And he described the scene saying this. He was in church with this man, and he said, A snowstorm was falling around us. The snowstorm was real. 
the preacher merely spectral. And the eye felt the sad contrast in looking at him and then out the window behind him into the beautiful meteor of the snow. All right. Emerson's disdain of this preacher's academically dry sermon continues, and he says, he had lived in vain, this man. He had no one word intimating that he had laughed or wept, was married or in love, had been commended or cheated or chagrined. If he had ever lived and acted, we were none the wiser for it. Now, although he did not name the preacher, supposedly everyone that day knew of whom he spoke, and it created quite the clamor in the papers, the social media of the time, for weeks to come. But nearly two centuries later, Emerson's words were exactly what this young seminarian needed to hear. Emerson called upon those young bards and myself to call forth spirit in our speaking and to make way in our worship for the spiritual dimension in people's lives. And I was on board with that and was stirred by that. So my friends, how do we call for the spirit? Well, according to Emerson, we do this by sharing our lives. And what a beautiful example we had this morning in our joys and sorrows sharings. He's saying we need to know that each other lived, not just what we think. We do this, Emerson counsels, by feeling the presence of sacredness that is life. For Emerson and his friends in Concord, it was all about nature, wasn't it? seeing the sacred in nature. And I think Emerson and I agree that worship is meant to awaken in us the ability to see the miracles all around us. He said, forget about the miracle of some one man. Look at the miracle of the flower that blooms. Emerson claims that the conversion takes place as the human is able to receive what he called beautiful sentiments which bestow on one the ability to see beauty through the pain of our lives, to see beauty, to know the miracle, to know the miracle of your very life, to touch the sacred as we hold this dual truth of the mundane in the world in which we were born and which we all will one day leave. Reading Emerson at that time, and even now, I often think of the great master who lived many miles and many years away from him. His name was Jaladeen Rumi, the famous 13th century Sufi, Muslim, mystic, and poet. Now, before he was a mystical poet, Rumi was a religious scholar himself and a teacher. And legend has it that one day, while Rumi was reading his large scholarly books near a pond, a spiritual, named, a spiritual man named Shamsi Tabrezi was passing by. And this man, this teacher, stopped and asked him, he said, what are you doing? It was a simple question that mystics often ask to trigger a debate. Discounting this ragged-looking man, Rumi replied, something you wouldn't understand. Surely this man was not read and learned as he was. At this point, Sham steps closer and grabs the books and throws them into the pond. An angry Rumi gets his books out of the water, but they are completely dry. In his surprise, Rumi looks up and says, what is this? To which Shams replies, something you cannot understand. And thus began the next stage of Rumi's life. Rumi and Shams would become much beloved to each other, spending many hours together. Shams taught Rumi the deeper meaning of love and life and his own faith. One day, the story goes, Shams disappears. It is believed perhaps murdered. And Rumi's heart was broken. 
And it is said that in his deep despair, that is when he began to turn. And you've heard of the whirling dervishes. So it is said that is when he began to turn around a pole, and he turned, and he turned, and he turned, until he found that he disappeared. And that he and his beloved were not actually separate. That he felt connected and transcendent. In a translation of one of his poems, he says, Why should I seek? I am the same as he. His essence speaks through me. I have been looking for myself. And in another poem, he says, A secret turning in us makes the universe turn. Head unaware of feet, and feet head neither cares. They just keep turning. It's a faith of experience, of transcendence. Now on the surface, Rumi's path may seem worlds away from our New England Unitarian ancestors and maybe even far away from our own. But I believe that Rumi and Emerson and Ken Sawyer and I are all really talking about the same thing each in our own way are saying that somehow, some way, we must give ourselves up to a religious or spiritual dimension that transcends what can be known by reason and study alone. A ministerial colleague once said to me that the role of the minister is simply to say, look, there's the sacred, and there's the sacred, and there, and there, and there. And if they were all here right now in some sort of time warp panel, we have Rumi and Emerson and Ken. I believe that Rumi and Emerson and Ken would all tell us that if our time together on a Sunday morning was not to be defrauded, that we must do several things, that we must show up, that we must allow our hearts to open, that we must allow ourselves to be in the presence of the miracle that is your very life right now as it is, and we must allow spirit to touch us and change us. Perhaps this has always been the message of religion. Perhaps this is what sets apart the full churches from the empty ones the ones who make room for the religious dimension by any name, instead of only dwelling on the mundaneness of life. So today, for our Meaning Matters Sunday time, I'm going to invite us to take some time to be in this church and sit together and practice this feeling of the religious dimension of your life in the presence of others. In the Quaker community, a worship service is a time to gather and specifically allow this sacred and holy, this soul, this God, use any words you want, to touch you. And then to speak from that place, sharing your heart. In a Quaker service, those that sit there agree to sit in silence but then speak when moved to speak. Now, we are not Quakers, and you might hold different language for all this than I've used this morning, but I believe that if we give it time, we can come to understand the languages of each other in the silence of our hearts as we sit together. So, welcome. So I'm going to invite us to, to sit together. We have not a whole lot of time, so don't panic if you're like, you know, if it feels like it's going to be an hour. But I'm going to invite you to just take some centering time and just sit. If your eyes closed helps you, please do that. Have your eyes closed, your soft eyes. And after I give this little introduction, I'm just going to be quiet. And I'm going to invite us to sit and feel 
What is the spiritual dimension of your life? Who are you? What does spirit, God, your deeper self, use any words you like, what wants to speak to you in the silence? So as we sit in the silence, I'll invite us to sit, and whenever anyone feels moved to speak, it can be anything at all you want to share, but something that has been moved from inside you to speak, perhaps about the sacred, perhaps about the mundane. I'll bring the mic around and you're welcome to share, but let us sit in silence. Mm Hi, I'm John Beard. Hearing the words that we just heard recalled for me a moment in this room um, that occurred within the last year or so, where Stephanie May was giving one of her very moving talks. She referred to the fact that she had been kind of a fundamentalist as a kid and grew up in a different religious environment, totally from the one that we live in. And she said, but every once in a while, something happens for me in my changed religious awareness, if you will. And that is some of the magic, if you will, all of the stories that we disbelieve come and visit me in all their power what do I do? She said, welcome it. As some of you know, I'm moving. After 30 years in the house that I'm in, I'm moving to Orleans, Massachusetts. The thing of it is, when you do that, you're confronted with all the things that you own, and you have to make sense of it, and you have to decide what to keep, and where to go, and how to deal with everything. And it's a smaller place than where I, where I am, so I have to get rid of some stuff in well as well. And this has been such a traumatic experience for me. I have 2,300 books, or at least I did. I counted them one day. <laughs> and I'm trying to find new homes. It's like I have these friends, these objects that, that, are, that are either friends to me or things that I acquired somewhere that I would like to hold in my hand and I can't anymore. But I can remember them. So that's all I have to say.
Um, hi, I'm Susie Klein. Um, Last spring, I heard an a Ezra Klein podcast interview with a sociologist at the University of Vermont who had just come out with a book about the epidemic of loneliness. And um, it was very disturbing. She was talking about the structural frameworks in our culture that make us lonelier and lonelier and lonelier, and it's getting worse. And, um, but while I was listening to it, I thought of as somebody who's an acquaintance of ours through our rowing club, a guy named Rob, who um, we don't know very well, but he has these like really great gatherings, like shredding parties in parking lots. And today we're going to a guac off where people are invited to make guacamole and then there's a competition to pick the best guacamole. And it, it, it's a huge effort for him to do this, but he brings people together. And when I had heard the Ezra Klein um, interview, I thought back to a sermon, a summer sermon that I heard very early on in our tenure in the church, like 20 years ago, uh, when Don Oliver spoke about how churches were one of the few institutions in our culture that are sw swimming upstream against capitalism and, and all these um, things that uh, do contribute to our epidemic of loneliness. Um, you know, our, choos are, our pews are empty here, but in a few hours, the parking lot at Shoppers World, you will not be able to get a place. And um, everyone's gonna be shopping. But um, anyway, so I mentioned this to Rob six months later and complimented him about how great he is, this rowing guy, about throwing these parties and it counters this epidemic of loneliness. And he proposed we have breakfast to pursue this topic more. So I had breakfast with him on Thursday and I don't know him that well. And he told me a little bit about his background. And then and it turns out he'd been to the Harvard School of Education, where Don Oliver was on the faculty. And we finally got around to the topic of the epidemic of loneliness. And he goes, I took this course from this guy at Harvard named Don Oliver. I'm like, oh, I so get it, Rob. So we had this you know, wonderful connection. And um, I, I saw a teacher once who had a, a uh, saying at the bottom of their email is, I touch the future, I teach. And so I, I just attribute to Dawn, you know, from this church and to this church and the let's keep swimming upstream against capitalism and all these other forces that are creating epidemics of loneliness. Mm. Mm. Invite us to go back into that time of silence. Sometimes it's nice after someone speaks to just have that moment to take in what you've heard and how it touched you. We had several people speak. So invite us to sit in silence for another moment. See if you can feel the speaker's voices. So often we want to analyze what someone has said. See if we can practice those arms wide open. I invite you to listen, listen to spirit coming into your own life. Perhaps there's a message just for you, one that perhaps you've been busy in your life, all the doing, all the thinking has allowed you time to listen. So let's take the next minute and invite you just to simply listen. invite you to feel feel the presence of your own spiritual teachers throughout the ages perhaps Ken Sawyer or other ministers who've been here or elsewhere 
perhaps inspirational teachers like Rumi or Emerson or any number of others I invite you to call their presence into this sacred time of listening. Perhaps hearing through their words a message for yourself. We're not going to interpret what that message is. <laughs> it is time for us to wrap up our service. So I invite you as you move forward in your days to give yourself that time of silence each day in whatever way works for you in your own spirituality, but remembering your own spiritual dimension and then bringing that into this space and inviting others to be in this space, to be there together. I'm going to invite us to extinguish our chalice together. The chalice words uh, that we're playing with are in the order of service. So if you want to pick those up and say those with me as we end our time together. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Thank you for this little experiment in our Meaning Matters Sundays. If you like it, let me know. Let Kate know. We'll keep doing these and do a different format each time. But the idea is that you know, we give time for sharing and communicating. And those of you online, I hope you are able to uh, be with us as well. I know I did not have a phone to take your, your chat. Uh, but I hope you really got that the, the idea here, the sharings were beautiful. And it wasn't just about the sharing. It really was about sitting together and being together in this spiritual space. So thank you. Please go now in peace. Take peace wherever you go, but then come back. <laughs> All right.